then I'll start recording. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Texas A&M ARMA R&D series. And today we are excited to have our speaker, Dr. Dussault, who probably uh, all of uh, students who are involved in hydraulic fracturing know uh, Dr. Dussault since his contribution into this area. And so Dr. Dussault teaches geological engineering at the University of Waterloo in Canada, has taught short courses in 28 countries, continues to be active in research and teaching. He works on subsurface energy geomechanics topics, including hydrocarbon development, hydraulic fracturing, energy storage, geothermal energy, carbon sequestration, and deep, deep injection disposal of granular solids and liquid wastes. Uh, he holds many patents and has about 650 full text papers published in journals and conferences. And with that, I think, Dr. Dussault, you can start your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Seri. And uh, like you say in Ukrainian, Dusha Dobra. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Okay, so today I'm, I'm going to uh, talk for a while about uh, a topic that's, of course, dear to my heart, and that is the use of the subsurface uh, to help us uh, in the energy transition that the world is is doing, that the world that that is on its way. Okay. So, why an energy transition? Well, uh, let's see if I can advance this. So what's happening here? Page down, there we go, all right. So basically we're starting to learn that there are, uh, we have learned that there are serious externalities associated with fossil fuel use. Uh, this picture of uh, Sao Paulo uh, in the tropical country shows a serious uh, issue of smog, of that uh, toxic mixture that is caused by uh, sunlight, uh, exhausts, particulate matter, and uh, so on. So these externalities have forced us to consider issues such as pollution and climate change, and maybe rethink what we do in terms of fossil fuel consumption. So the premise uh, of, of my, of my uh, presentation is that this energy transition implies decarbonization of primary energy sources. Notice that I didn't say we're going to stop using oil and gas, but we are likely going to greatly reduce our use of these fossil fuels in primary energy sources, such as automobiles, transportation, uh, but we will still use them for sure for petrochemistry and plastics and other products. So we want to replace the use of fossil fuels with some, something else. And that implies different transportation fuels, uh, displacing coal and uh, oil uh, in, in the uh, energy business with wind, solar, geothermal, and other potential sources. We want to improve uh, our energy efficiency and, and storage capacity because we can't have wind and solar without energy storage. And batteries, in my view, are not the answer to grid scale energy storage. I believe that we can use the subsurface very intelligently to help us with the energy transition and avoid these types of events. So even though this is six years old, this image, um, it shows you what happens in Mexico City. Uh, I believe Mexico City qualifies as the second largest city in the world in terms of uh, overall population. I think Tokyo is number one, although I'm not sure. And when you have such a high concentration population with automobiles and city buses and trucks, burning diesel, burning gasoline, things happen that are not healthy. The uh, World Health Organization 
who tracks these things, they claim that 7 million people worldwide every year die as a result of air pollution. Their data show that nine out of 10 people in cities in particular, of course, breathe air that exceeds the World Health Organization guidelines. These, what, what people breathe in contain high levels of pollutants and it's not necessarily pollutants like sulfur gases or uh, nitro, nitrogen gases, it's pollutants such as particulate matter. Obviously, because of less concern for automobile exhaust quality, low and middle income countries suffer from the highest exposure. This is Romania about a decade ago, and you can see the coal fired power plants in the back emitting uh, water vapor mainly, but in that water vapor is also very large uh, amounts of uh, PM 2.5, the fine grained particulate matter that is responsible mainly for these premature deaths. Okay, uh, natural gas uh, storage, we can do that in the subsurface. Uh, we can do carbon sequestration in the subsurface. We can achieve secure and safe and environmentally friendly liquid and solid waste disposal in the deep subsurface. We can use the subsurface for energy storage, pumped hydro, compressed air. We can store heat in the subsurface. We can store cold in the subsurface. We can store hydrogen in the subsurface. And of course, geothermal heat and power as potential uh, means of reducing our dependency on fossil fuels. So uh, getting down to the subsurface uh, requires some technology, which uh, of course you're all familiar with. Uh, this is a shale gas play in the Eagle Ford uh, shale just, uh, just down the road uh, from your people there and a little bit to the east, northeast. And uh, whether you're storing energy, whether you're disposing wastes, whether you're accessing geothermal energy, et cetera, you need surface equipment, uh, well heads, pressure control in a number of circumstances, et cetera. And that, that's basically our technology. That's oil field, uh, oil field technology. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some selected subjects that I've been involved in over the years. And one of them is uh, carbon sequestration as solid carbon achieved through the injection at depth of biosolids. So let's consider Houston, as an example. Within a thousand meters or 1500 meters of the surface are highly permeable porous sandstones. And it is very straightforward to inject slurried biosolids into these sandstones uh, in massive quantities. What then happens is that methanogenic bacteria that don't need oxygen, break down the organic materials and leave behind about 50% of the carbon as a solid mass. This is nothing but the well-known geological process of what we call coalification or nature making coal out of organic matter. Furthermore, this process involves about say 12 or 13% of the mass of the, dry, uh, of the dry organic matter being turned into methane. So in principle, we can harvest that. It's a form of energy recycling. We want to access the heat in the subsurface, not just steam uh, for geothermal power generation, but heat in the rocks and heat in the liquids in sedimentary basins. So EGS stands for Enhanced Geothermal Systems and said heat stands for the heat extracted from fluids in sedimentary rocks. If you're gonna extract fluids from sedimentary rocks, you have to have porosity and permeability 
And of course, enhanced geothermal systems need large scale multi-well stimulation technologies. And then there's energy storage. We can store energy in the subsurface in order to factor in more renewable energy into our grids. And there's a number of ways of doing that. I'll briefly touch upon three. Compressed air energy storage, uh, pumped hydro energy storage, and heat storage in geothermal systems, which is of course particularly valuable in Canada where we have a persistent and ongoing need for heat. So let's look at uh, biosolids injection as a means of uh, treating biological solids. So every one of us produces on the order of maybe uh, half a kilogram of, bi of dry biological solids every day. And there is an accepted treatment method for that that undergoes a number of stages and then eventually the sludge, which contains heavy metals, and maybe it even contains viruses that are not entirely deactivated. The sludge is spread on the, on the fields uh, in some areas or, for example, uh, east of Los Angeles, it's actually spread on desert land. Well, that's one way to do it. And that's expensive. In Los Angeles, for every dry ton, dry ton of biological solids, they spend about $115 to treat that and then eventually dispose of it. We can actually do it more cheaply through injection using oil field technology. So this is the world's first biosolids injection site. Uh, I held a patent under my name for the biosolids injection process and the recovery of methane. That patent is expiring now. And I was involved somewhat, not directly, uh, but somewhat with this, uh, this project. It was handled out of the United States by Michael Bruno. I'm sure some of you heard that name. So in Los Angeles, the uh, sludge underwent a, some treatment and uh, filtering to take away the big particles. And then the biosolid sludge was homogenized with wastewater and injected into an oil field 1,350 meters deep in, uh, within the boundary of Los Angeles. So that's what we do. We slurry the biosolids injected at depth with wastewater. Anaerobic decomposition takes place. Methane is generated. Carbon dioxide and water are additional byproducts of this decomposition. Carbon dioxide is very soluble in the water, so it enters the formation waters at depth, becomes dissolved. And the elemental carbon, or the residue, is permanently sequestered as a solid material. So that means that the chances of risk are Zero, uh, pardon me, the risks of, uh, of leakage are zero compared to, for example, carbon dioxide sequestration. Furthermore, the process is cheaper than the treatment systems that many big cities have. In the Houston area, you could be getting rid of all of Houston's biosolid waste by injecting it 1,200, 1,500 meters underground maybe recover the methane. So you're achieving some energy recycling and it's very secure process. Per year, if you convert the carbon to, uh, to uh, uh, carbon dioxide, that means 600 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent are sequestered every year. And you multiply that by 5 million people or so and it starts to add up year after year after year, so that it's an ongoing process that continues to sequester carbon. To me, that makes a lot more sense than carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, if you have the choice, because you're getting rid of a waste, you're saving money, and you're doing it in a very secure manner because the waste is residing in the ground as a solid material. But of course, you have to do it right. You want to do it in a permeable formation where the pressures will not build up 
uh, over time. You want to have barriers between uh, you and the surface to make sure that there's no groundwater interaction. And you have to design and operate your well correctly. But the technology is straightforward. Material is homogenized, maybe some primary treatment. It's pumped down as a slurry with about 15% uh, solid matter in the slurry. And remember the slurry is wastewater. And then down below here, you see that uh, the decomposition will generate methane, which if you have the right geology, you can recover the methane for beneficial purposes. So the tire project in Los, An Los Angeles uh, uh, tried this in full prototype. And uh, they basically uh, used an old depleted oil field, about 5,000 feet underground. All of the dangerous agents are sequestered permanently. That's a really important aspect. So that your sludges, which a lot of people are worried about and farmers don't like sludges necessarily. Well, the sludges are removed from the biosphere entirely along with the trace metals and chemicals that uh, they may still contain. So that's one subsurface technology that can help us address the energy transition and maybe reduce costs of sanitary biosolids treatment. You can co-dispose other materials like this sludge that you're looking at. Uh, this sludge in Alberta is being mixed with water in a mixer and injected at a depth of about 600 meters in a very high permeability sandstone, uh, actually that is below some of the uh, shallow heavy oil beds. Here in the middle of Sumatra, uh, the Duri oil field was the largest heavy oil field in all of Asia for many years. It's now being gradually ramped down. This facility was built uh, 20 years ago. The, uh, the sludge ponds, in the jungle were cleared by pumping out the sludge and dredging out the sludge. And the sludge was brought here and injected through this pump system. Here you see the pumps that are uh, taking the waste, slurrying it with water and sending it out to wells uh, nearby. I believe this project eventually used 12 wells and it turned this particular, uh, this particular uh, oil field into almost a zero, uh, zero waste oil field in terms of solid and liquid waste. Did a lot, lot of environmental benefits. So I mentioned Houston, one huge city in the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Iran, has a very serious biosolids disposal problem. They cannot keep up with the population growth and the waste growth. And uh, there are issues of surface contamination and there's chemicals that, uh, that it's a polluted city. So this is a kind of a aerial view of Tehran. And it turns out that the conditions for uh, deep uh, biosolids disposal are absolutely ideal. I'll explain why. So we've got the mountains that are high to the north of the city. North is uh, straight up here. And the city goes downhill gradually from the north to the south. And the wedge of sediments gets thicker and thicker. So this is the city of Tehran. And the Tehran plain in, uh, to the south of the city is underlain by many uh, thick sandstone sequences that are ideal for waste injection. So this is the, uh, the map. Uh, I'll just show you a, a very, very uh, diagrammatic section here from the Alborz Mountains down into the Foreland Basin. It's all downhill. 
That means something very important. That means that the groundwater flow is actually all down and to the right. So that if there are any chemical agents carried in the groundwater that is being uh, affected somewhat by these biosolids, those agents are absorbed as they flow down the uh, sedimentary uh, sequence here. They're absorbed by clay minerals. They're uh, absorbed by on the surface of silica minerals and the water ends up being cleaned. In fact, that's how my city here, Waterloo, that's how we clean our water that comes from the sewage plant. After it's filtered and turned into clear water, we spray it up on the highlands and it enters into the groundwater system. And after it transits uh, half a kilometer or a kilometer through the groundwater system, the water is cleaned right up. Of course, there are, are geomechanics issues to be managed. You've got to inject your uh, biosolids under hydraulic fracture conditions. So your pressures have to be larger than, uh, than the minimum, uh, the, larger than the vertical stress, actually. You have to make sure that you have a target formation that is responding well so that the pore pressures are dissipated rapidly enough to avoid large scale pressurization. That usually involves injection into two or three, perhaps four wells. Sequentially. So you inject for say seven hours in one well, and then you shut that in. You move to another well to continue your injection. And the pressures from the first well gradually dissipate in the high permeability subsurface. You have to consider stress changes because you're putting in a lot of volume change into the rock mass, and that's going to change your stresses. One of the consequences of stress changes is that your fractures initially, for example, under the city of Houston, when you first start, your fractures will be vertical. Well, as you jam more solids in to the waste pod at depth, you find that fairly quickly, you become totally dominated, or not totally, but largely dominated by hydraulic fracturing components. And we know that from uh, taking measurements in, in uh, in, in Texas, Jasper County experiments, and also in other places in the world where we're injecting solids in large quantities. So there are geomechanics issues. We have to design and manage it properly. Geothermal energy is, a, uh, is very hyped up these days. And let me be very clear, trying to extract value from low-grade geothermal energy in, in the crust is extremely difficult and expensive. Here in Canada, geothermal energy has to compete with natural gas energy, to heat homes, for example, uh, hydropower, and we've got a lot of hydropower in Canada, nuclear power, we still have some nuclear plants, and uh, these other energy sources, including wind and solar, are getting cheap. So making money from geothermal energy is tough business. Nevertheless, Canada is a country that needs a lot of heat. Uh, now, this is a map of the uh, heat energy uh, in terms of petajoules uh, at a depth of 6.5 kilometers. And you'll see the blue areas, like where I'm sitting right now in Toronto, down at the bottom there, the blue area. That means that you have to drill very deep in order to get fluids that are hot enough or rock that is hot enough to generate electrical power. But everybody talks about electrical power, electrical power, electrical power. And yet in Canada, in the far north uh, and in the northern parts of provinces like Saskatchewan and Alberta, we need heat. As an example, this is uh, a city of 7,500 people in uh, the, the Arctic islands, Iqaluit. And you can see that the temperature in the summer only gets to 10 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's, that's like uh, 55, 60 degrees, 65 degrees Fahrenheit maximum. So you need heat all year round. And in the months of uh, November, December, January, February, and March, you need 
a lot of heat. So the homes in this small city consume 80% of the energy that they consume just to provide heat. And right now that is fuel oil, fuel oil. Now, if we're going to decarbonize, maybe we can replace that heat need with heat from geothermal fluids. And maybe if the fluids are hot enough, we can generate some power. So let's look at said heat or heat from liquids and sediments. Uh, we need to have porosity, permeability, and volumes in order to, 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 go, to go down that pathway economically. And we have two loops that are, that are uh, separate. We have what we call the primary loop, and we're producing hot water from depth. It is passing through a heat exchanger, and it's uh, uh, returning to depth as warmish water. Uh, heat exchangers are never 100% efficient. You are always constrained by rates. And let me give you an idea of how much the rates are. The first sedimentary heat or set heat project in Canada has been uh, constructed uh, now, and they're just finishing it up. And in a few months, there's going to be power generated. They propose to generate 20 to 30 megawatts. That's enough, uh, that's enough for a city of 30,000 people uh, from 10 wells, 10 horizontal wells, six producers and four injectors. To do that, they need six barrels of brine of water per second, not per minute, per second. That's 100,000 barrels a day. And no oil well in existence comes even close to that. So these have to be many wells and fairly large diameter wells so that the, so that the uh, friction losses are, are moderate or acceptable. And then, of course, the heat is turned into electrical power. And if the temperature of your working fluid is not, not too high, it's a very inefficient process. In fact, it's much more efficient to use the heat directly if you can. And that's where Canada comes in, is that we need heat. So this is during the drilling phase of this project. It's only uh, three kilometers north of the American border in Saskatchewan. This is three years ago, and now the site looks totally different because they have their, their organic ranking system, etc. cetera. Uh, so the site is about 3.2 kilometers deep. And recently they just published that uh, they, they have actually 120 degrees Celsius water. And the original contract was for five megawatts. Well, they bumped that up to 20 to 30 megawatts and that's why uh, they need uh, over 900 liters or six barrels a second uh, to generate the necessary heat flux for the, for the organic ranking cycle engines. All of these wells require hydraulic stimulation. All of these wells require the management of hypersaline water, brines that are totally saturated with sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. And uh, the brines are returned to the subsurface. That's the way we have to do it, of course. So that's said heat. Now, suppose you have just hot rock. Well, the idea is that you can go and exploit that heat by injecting cool fluid. The hot fluid rises up to the surface, pumped actually. And by the way, pumping means more energy. You have to spend energy going through a organic ranking cycle system and generating both power and heat. Uh, instead of just generating power, which everybody focuses on, these types of systems can be more profitable if you have a, um, if you have a, a need for the heat. But electrical power and heat are very different. Electrical power, I can put it in those wires and I can send it 500 kilometers. 
Heat must be used locally. That means that if I want a heat project, I have to have my enhanced geothermal system very close to that, uh, that user sector, the homes and the buildings that will use the heat. So we need hot dry rock at least 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, we need to get the heat from it to the surface. We need to convert it to electrical power and recover some of the heat as well. I remind you that we cannot do this in rock masses unless we create connectivity between these wells. These wells are spaced maybe four or 500 meters apart, maybe. We have to learn how to do hydraulic stimulation of wells that are, are widely spaced apart because the wider apart they are, the better it is for us in terms of heat extraction at depth. Okay, so we have this primary loop, just like in the set heat process. And we're injecting, uh, we're injecting the uh, cool fluid and we're trying to convert it to useful energy. And there's another technology that people are looking at and not just in Canada, but also in Nevada and California. And that's going into a situation where you have very hot rock and drilling a number of horizontal wells that might be two, three kilometers long and extracting the heat by conductive heat flux in the rock mass. So cool liquid is injected into the well bore. That's the, uh, that's the bluish to yellowish, and then it heats up. That gives you the red color here. And the hot liquids are passed through a system to extract electrical power. And the warm liquids are returned immediately back to the second half of the loop. So here you see the fluid flowing from the right to the left in the close part of the loop. And then in the secondary part behind, the fluid is flowing from the left to the right. So it's a continuous loop and it's called the Everloop concept. The uh, conductive heat flux is very slow. You need high temperature differences, you need long well lengths, you need efficient power engines, and so on, in order to make this power competitive with existing power sources. If you can use the heat as well, you are gaining additional value as long as that heat can be used beneficially. A problem is that many of our towns and cities are simply not equipped for district heating. That means retrofitting and expense. But some cities are coping with that as we speak. For example, in Finland, uh, they are drilling a couple of uh, seven kilometer deep uh, wells. That's uh, 23,000 feet into granite. And what you're looking at in the middle of the picture is the world's largest percussion drilling rig. It's developed by a company called Strata Energy. And instead of doing standard oil field rotary drilling, they do percussion drilling. So it's an air hammer if the, uh, for the shallower hole and for the deep hole, it's a water hammer. And in granites and other brittle rocks, you can achieve much substantially higher penetration rates than with uh, rotary drilling, even with modern uh, uh, bit designs. Although rotary drilling is getting better and better all the time. But then so is percussion drilling. There's a number of research projects, mainly in Europe, to increase the uh, drilling rate by 40, 45% by, uh, bit redesign and by the use of high pressure uh, water jets in combination with the percussion drilling. So they've already drilled a hole seven kilometers deep or 
date, I think, and uh, are going to be drilling a second one. And it's very interesting that this project has nothing to do with electrical power. It has everything to do with heat. They will be mining the heat to heat a community of about 20,000 homes, 25,000 homes. All of the heat will be provided through a heat distribution system that, that they are installing as a retrofit because buildings are not typically built uh, even in Finland to take district heating. However, we have severe limitations. Drilling costs increase exponentially with depth, but heat in the rock mass increase only linearly with depth. So that puts a real severe limit to our, to our depth. At the depth of 6.8 kilometers, they are at 140 degrees Celsius, I believe. Yes, 140 degrees Celsius. They have to stimulate the wells to connect them, create a large surface area for heat exchange, and also access to natural fractures. Exclusively for district heating, no power generation. However, it is possible, of course, with EGS to also generate uh, electrical power. And again, I keep on going back to the same theme for geothermal energy is a combination of some power, but also the using the heat may be the most economically beneficial approach to geothermal energy in situations where you don't have high grade steam or, or really hot rocks. So there are new cycles coming out. The standard cycle that you've probably heard about is the organic Rankine cycle to uh, take the, some energy from hot water and put it through the organic Rankine cycle engine and generate power. But there are new approaches to this and the whole technology is moving quite rapidly. Uh, many of us who are technology optimists like I am, uh, believe that we're gonna be doing much more efficient energy extraction using uh, these new cycles in the next 10 years, 15 years than we are right now. So things are getting better, but we still have to go down and fracture the rock mass. We have to develop low temperature turbines. And there's a whole bunch of patents and a whole bunch of publications in the last five years about low temperature turb turbines, low temperature engines. So things are moving fast. So to develop a power from, from, from depth, uh, we have to drill deep boreholes cheaply, and that's up to you. Better methods. We have to do massive hydraulic stimulation. We have to inject cool fluids and withdraw hot fluids and recirculate the cool fluids. And there will be issues, and one of them is microseismic activity. So a lot of research is going on in the United States. Uh, this is uh, from uh, one of the uh, government websites uh, to, to look at uh, EGS and said heat uh, as energy sources that are carbon free. And we do know that deep in the ground, the rock masses are already natural, uh, naturally fractured. Uh, and uh, what we're doing mainly is not really fracturing the rock, what really we're doing is opening up pre-existing fractures and shearing other fractures, natural fractures, by a process that some people call hydro shearing. So it's not really hydraulic fracture per se. So I prefer the term hydraulic stimulation. Well, things are not simple for us because now we have to do some very complex mathematical modeling and we are gonna have pressure changes, te temperature changes and effective stress changes. And those changes affect the rock mass parameters such as uh, the uh, conductivity of natural fractures uh, and, and other things. So if we write the, uh, the simplest set of reasonable differential equations that we, uh, that we can, uh, this is a uh, set of uh, three coupled equations that have to be solved simultaneously uh, for heat flux, uh, for uh, flux of pressure, uh, any changes in porosity, uh, changes in deformation, we have to couple everything together because 
when we change the stress, we actually change the conductivity of individual fractures. So we can't solve this problem without uh, what we call a full thermal thermo hydromechanical model. And these are the simplest equations that we can write down, but it gets, it gets hairier. These are not necessarily constant in the rock mass as temperatures and stresses and pressures change. All of these parameters, and we normally think of parameters as being constant, all of these parameters are evolving somewhat with the changes in pressure, temperature, and stress. So this means that the problem is very nonlinear. Now that gives us a particular difficulty in, uh, in uh, modeling uh, EG EGS systems because we have to be able to make predictions for 25 years because that's the life of a, of a project. And right now we're not there yet. We are not there yet. We have to develop better predictive models and we have to find ways of hydrofracturing to access larger rock masses and larger surface areas. We need much cheaper drilling technology and so on. So there's a huge rich area here for new ideas. So let's finish off, uh, I'll accelerate a little bit here with uh, subsurface energy storage. Now you might think of natural gas. Well, we'll skip this because we, we know about that. In compressed air, storage at depth in the subsurface, where we look at two different technologies. One of them is in the rock mass itself, like salt caverns or permeable strata, but also we can store high pressure air in steel cased cemented well bores. Well, there you go. Again, oil field technology. Pumped hydro, maybe not so much oil field technology, but it's entirely possible in the subsurface, for example, in abandoned mines. And we also can store heat in the ground. So if we have excess heat from solar energy or from geothermal energy or from some other source, the idea is let's store the heat in the ground so that we can use it in the winter when we need it. And that problem is being studied by a lot of people here in Canada where we need the heat. But I want to also say that you can store cool in the ground as well. So that in very uh, hot climates, if you have a large repository uh, of, in the ground, you can store a lot of cool over an annual cycle. Uh, why storage? Well, grid management, because we have to manage our grid on a, on a millisecond basis. Storage, because that means more uh, uh, renewable energy like wind and solar. So that's decarbonization. And of course, those are under, underlaid by, by climate issues. So wind is intermittent, but the generation costs are now dropping down below five cents a kilowatt hour. We believe that the costs will drop below three cents a kilowatt hour on average uh, in about four or five years. That's, that's what, what it's looking like in many places. But you've got to add the storage costs as well. So wind energy is variable. Uh, that sharp, uh, pardon me, the dotted red line is your grid demand. And the wind power is highly variable. You can see from the uh, variations. And it varies at scales of seconds to, to 10 days. I mean, we have variations at many, many time scales. And we have to find a way of coping with that, storing the variable energy and then emitting it as nice smooth energy when it's when it's needed. It's the same thing with solar power. Uh, in Nevada, solar power is now a drop, and, and Australia, nice warm places where there's a lot of sun, solar power is dropping below five cents a kilowatt hour, and it is predicted to get down to two cents a kilowatt hour uh, by 2025, I believe, or maybe 2026, but it's also very intermittent. And, no law, and not only is it intermittent uh, on a second by second basis, this shows you the variability for the city of London in the United Kingdom from year to year. That orangish color or whatever it is there uh, it, is the variability over many years of the solar radiation in the summer. 
So you have to deal with uncertainty and variability at scales that are from the second to scales of years. And we have to be able to cope with that and yet still provide the client base with reliable, steady energy. So these are issues that we can use the subsurface to, to help us with. So we need to store excess energy. We also need to smooth it. The grid does not like short-term variations in the energy supply. The grid likes nice, nice smooth inputs. Uh, so when there's excess base load or too much renewables, we want to use that to do peak shaving to avoid wasting base energy and other factors. Now, whenever, whenever, whenever somebody says the word storage, most people think of batteries. And the world's largest uh, uh, battery farm is in Moss Landing in California. Uh, uh, they had a fire here in August that shut it down for a while. And uh, batteries are little rectangular buckets of chemical soup. It takes a lot of chemistry to make the batteries and it takes a lot of chemistry to recycle the batteries. And that means wastes and that means uh, environmental issues. So batteries are great, but really you're not going to use batteries for huge long-term grid storage. They're too expensive, but you need them for shorter term uh, load balancing. Pumped hydro, well, we already have hydropower and we can use our existing hydropower as a means of storing energy. So when we don't uh, need the hydropower because there's a lot of renewable energy, well, then the water is just stored behind the dam and then we use it when we need it. Uh, so it's a, it's a storage system or we can create pumped hydro. Uh, compressed air, yes. It's very versatile. We can use it anywhere, actually. Uh, and pumped hydro, maybe not. It's hard to believe that you could use pumped hydro in Saudi Arabia. Uh, hydrogen, we're not there yet. We are a generation away from large-scale hydrogen use. But in compressed air, for example, I can create a salt gallery, or I can use a saline aquifer to store excess heat. I'm sorry, excess energy in the form of compressed air. And you see there in the middle of the, uh, the compressor, that's a very high uh, pressure compressor. And then when we need it, we pass it through a turbine. Now it could be a turbine that is natural gas fired, or it could be just what we call an air expanding turbine. But again, you can see the geomechanics uh, issues arising here. Uh, the design and the management, uh, the building of the uh, salt galleries or the saline aquifer, are uh, fundamental to the success of this uh, compressed air energy concept. Now, in some areas, you have salt at the right depths. For example, in Saskatchewan, we have salt at uh, 1,000 uh, meters to 1,400 meters, which is just the perfect depth for, for this type of technology. Uh, in California, you don't. So they're looking at porous aquifers for compressed air energy storage. So in this case, you're pushing air down and pushing the water level down in an aquifer. And then when you want the power, the air is coming back up to drive your air turbines. I'll just skip a few things. The first uh, project in the world for compressed air that recovers the heat of compression is actually a very small project in, in uh, Ontario. And it's now producing a very small amount of power, just 1.75 megawatts. But the key thing that makes it different from the other two or three projects that exist in the world is that the heat of compression is recovered and most of it is used to heat the air during the expansion. So that's the uh, cross section of the cavern. We've already had problems because this is an old cavern that they're repurposing. So they've had a roof fall and they had to fix the casing and, and on and on. If we start from scratch, then we can create very well-designed caverns, properly designed, so that they have a high degree of geomechanic stability. And here are just some images. That's the uh, injection well into the cavern. Uh, that's the heat storage in those tanks. Uh, they store it in a thermal oil called Thermanol. 
and uh, the the uh, the maximum output is 1.75 megawatts, and the amount of energy stored is eight megawatt hours. So uh, that means that they can put out 1.75 megawatts for about five hours, and it's only used for peaking at the time of day when you need that energy. But you can also use a cased well. We, are, we have off the shelf, high pressure, high temperature technology in the oil industry. So we can design a steel cased well bore, cemented in place and use it as a pressure vessel. We can take that pressure vessel up to, uh, up to 40, 40 uh, megapascals. That's, you know, many, many uh, PSI, that's 40, 40 that's uh, 6,000 PSI. And we can take that well up to 200, 250 degrees Celsius safely. This is off the shelf technology. So if we have one of these wells, uh, we can store enough uh, uh, energy, depending upon the diameter of the well, of course, and the, and the volume, maybe on the order of five megawatts, uh, megawatt hours per, per well. So if we have an array of wells like this, these are not really wells, these are gas wells, but I'm just using this for illustration, then we can store a lot of energy to balance the uh, renewable energy and provide smooth power to the grid. Here again, we see the compressor on the left run by electricity, of course, the well in the middle and the expanders on the right. Now this is, uh, uh, you need heat because when you expand air, it cools down dramatically and you can't afford to have ice forming in your turbines. So one approach is to use fuel. Another approach is to try to store the energy, uh, the heat from the compression and use that for, uh, to heat up your air. And that is what I mentioned before for the project here in Ontario. So basically the compressed air energy solution is to take this very, very irregular power uh, store the irregular part, store the irregular part in a salt cavern or in say cased wells for smaller loads and smooth it out so that the compressed air energy storage can actually serve as the peaking energy uh, to support the base load uh, power that is available. If you have very large storage, like in uh, very large salt caverns, you can actually even emulate base load if you wish. Uh, cost more money, of course. So compressed air energy storage not only allows you to store the energy and use it later, it smooths the energy out and it provides extremely high quality energy for the grid. That's very important for grid management as well. Uh, we call that the inertia effect. You need to have a lot of inertia in the grid uh, to suppress uh, small variations in, in demand. And compressed air energy storage is a way of doing that very effectively. Batteries, not so much. And then of course, heat storage. We already do heat storage through ground source heat pumps, uh, but we're doing it more and more in Canada. And uh, we want to store heat, low grade heat, and uh, we're looking at technologies now to create larger geo repositories for heat storage. And again, uh, these could be quite deep. They, they could be kilometers deep or they could be 500 meters deep in hard rock uh, to create the large volumes. Because if we're going to store heat seasonally, we need a large volume so the heat losses are manageable. Just think about a cup of coffee. It cools down in 20 minutes. But if you have a gallon jug of coffee, it cools down in an hour. And if you have a 100 gallon tank of coffee, well, it cools down even more slowly because the amount of heat is a function of the volume, but the amount of heat loss is a function of the surface area. So surface area is R squared, whereas volume is R cubed. So that ratio of surface area to volume is, is a ratio that we use to estimate how, how large you need a repository to store heat. Uh, I'll skip this slide, it, it's a bit complicated and just go to the, uh, one of my last slides here. 
Uh, another means of uh, storing large amounts of energy is pumped hydro. So here we have a hypothetical underground mine that is now depleted. So a pump house is created underground and connected to an upper reservoir during periods of power need the water passes through the generators and the difference in elevation here is between the upper reservoir and the uh, mine water is your uh, your energy it's uh, delta z times g times the mass flux right and when you have excess power from your nuclear reactor, from your base load, from renewable energy, then you pump water back up to the upper reservoir. A pro project is proposed, a very large project with a huge amount of power output, a uh, thousand megawatts, that's, that's pretty big for pumped hydro and uh, much, much bigger than any pumped hydro operation in the world today. And this is being proposed for a, a region here in Southern Ontario, where uh, they're taking advantage of about 250 meters of vertical elevation and Lake Huron as the uh, lower reservoir. So they would pump it up and then let it flow down when they need the power. Okay, so there are surface impacts of these facilities, of course, there's subsurface impacts. These structures have to be safe. They have to be stable. Uh, we're accessing saline aquifers. We have to get rid of the saline water uh, safely and uh, environmentally securely. There are thermal issues. There's microseismic concerns in geothermal and storage of heat or coal because you're changing the temperature. So the rock mass is shrinking when you cool it and expanding when you heat it. So the stresses are changing quite dramatically. Uh, you have to integrate different systems, perhaps we have better efficiencies if we integrate, uh, for example, compressed air energy storage along with geothermal heat to heat the air up when we pass it through the expanders. And uh, that's an active area of, of, of research that I'm involved in. So this is a very, very rich area to work in. It's really rich. We. Uh, we have all kinds of work to do as rock mechanics people, as uh, petroleum engineers, to, to develop these technologies, to reduce costs, to reduce drilling costs, and so on. We have a lot of thermodynamics and mechanical engineering work to do to create better systems and to integrate these various energy sources, different energy storage systems, and different energy end uses. So I believe that we are on the cusp of a major move towards using the subsurface to help us in this energy transition. We're on a major uh, roadway to find economical methods of using uh, geothermal heat. Uh, we are working hard to do sequestration of carbon as carbon dioxide, of course, but also as solid carbon. I mentioned the biosolids injection. And in conjunction with that, we have to look at our built habitats. For example, many of you may not re realize it, but uh, in, in Texas uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, houses were never built with insulation because you just crank up the air conditioner. Well, nowadays new houses are built with insulation because the uh, cost of energy is going up and uh, insulation keeps cold in during the hot summer, as well as keeping heat in during a cold winter. So in Houston, you want to keep that air conditioning in when it's 95 degrees and with 95% humidity outside. Well, in Canada, we want to keep the heat in, not the cold in, but we want to keep the heat in when it's uh, minus uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity is 5%. Okay, so very different environmental circumstances. So I'm done and I just want to uh, recommend to each and every one of you uh, that, that is a student at some time in your career, uh, pardon me, that is early in your career, 
uh, I'm going to make, I'm going to say that you're going to be involved one way or another in the energy transition. And it's really important to consider these technologies and see how you can fold them into the work that you do constructively to help us uh, with climate change, to help us with energy poverty. There's still two and a half billion people in the world that, that are suffering from energy poverty. They just don't have the energy that they need to live comfortably. So I'm done and thank you for the invitation. I hope my, my message uh, resonates uh, with you, uh, not only in rock mechanics, but in petroleum engineering and mechanical engineering as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Dussault. Uh, any questions from students? Uh, if you have any, please unmute yourself or write in the chat. So far, we have the question from Bo Luo. Uh, Dear Professor, does the injectivity loss happens during the loan injection time? Uh, what are the measures we can take to avoid the loss? I'm not 100% sure specifically. Sure. But... Uh, injectivity loss will be accompanying, uh, for example, biosolids injection. As time goes on, you're creating a larger and larger waste pod, many fractures and all, very complicated. And it means that the near wellbore environment is going to become more and more permeability constrained. So there are ways of managing the biosolids injection process uh, along with the in injection of uh, more granular wastes sequentially to sustain uh, permeable pathways and to sustain injectivity. We know that, we've done it. In the case of geothermal energy, sustaining injectivity is not a problem because what you were doing is we're cooling the rock. And by cooling the rock, we're actually opening up these, these uh, natural fractures a little bit more and a little bit more. And that in fact creates a problem that we call thermal short circuiting, uh, which we have to do some good engineering to overcome. So sustaining injectivity, Injectivity is generally not a problem. However, in the injection well for a geothermal project, a sedimentary heat project, project, we're returning those cool brines into the reservoir and we can get mineral deposition around the injection wells. Uh, people are working on that right now in the geochemistry domain. But that also means that if we are suffering gradual declines in injectivity, we're going to have to do perhaps repeated hydraulic stimulation of our injection wells to sustain the injectivity of these wells. So it's a good question. It occurs in a number of domains in this uh, subsurface use. I have a question. What are your thoughts about extracting lithium from brine while producing oil and gas? I, ha I don't know much about the geochemistry of extracting lithium in very, you know, from the water in very small uh, concentrations. Uh, there are all kinds of people that, that are, again, working on that. But my, uh, my response is, if you've got uh, lithium in concentrations of, uh, you know, uh, four or 500 parts per million, apparently that's on the verge of, you know, commercial extraction. Right now in Alberta, there's a, an exploration program being funded by the provincial government in part and by industry in part, looking for regions in Alberta where we have exceptionally high lithium concentrations in the oil field brines for the co-production of lithium. So it's, it's, it's an important one. Every ge geothermal project that you do, uh, you, know, you should be looking at things like lithium, uh, as a potential revenue source. Uh, magnesium carbonate, if you happen to have a magnesium carbonate water, which is unusual, but you know, if you have magnesium carbonate uh, in, in solution, that is a, a valuable mineral uh, that you might be able to extract. But all of these deep brines that we use in said heat are very, uh, they're very saturated with sodium chloride. So the extraction of a small amount of lithium <coughs> or other minerals is, is uh, technically quite, quite complicated. Mm -hmm. There's a, 
one more thing that I want to mention about deep drilling and, uh, and geochemistry. You know, the richest ore bodies have been exploited. And now uh, getting metals and gold and silver and other valuable materials from deep in the earth, uh, a mine is extremely expensive. So there's a whole area of deep subsurface leach mining chemical mining that, that is starting just now starting to emerge because if you have an ore body that maybe has you know uh, 20,000 tons of uh, of metals that you can that you can recover but that's not very much it's not enough to warrant a mine but if you have some cheap drilling you can drill many many wells closely spaced and with the appropriate chemistry you can leach out these metallic minerals and then extract the metals from them beneficially. So I think that we are uh, on the verge of seeing leach mining, which we do a little bit at the surface, but we're, we're on the verge of using, again, oil and gas uh, technology to access smaller ore bodies at depth to extract the values with, uh, with chemistry. Leach mining has a very important future, I believe. Very interesting. Uh, thank you. Are there any uh, other questions? Okay, so uh, I think we uh, have a question from another question. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, sorry, were you going to read a quote, Dr. Duso? Um, my name is Patty Edgar, and I work, I assist with career services here in the College of Geosciences. Mm -hmm. and, um, really, really enjoyed your talk. I'm really fascinated with this whole idea of energy transition and what it means for our students' careers. And um, I'm wondering sort of what your advice would be um, to students in sort of, um, especially those working the subsurface and sort of um, thinking about their careers moving forward and how that's going to evolve um, with the, the transition, the things that are going on, even with the big oil and gas companies, things that are going on in a lot of these ventures. Just kind of curious what your take on that is. I, I think that, that every student has to think for herself about widening their knowledge base. There is a tendency, especially in graduate students that are working with, you know, with the supervisor and the supervisor wants a result that in the grand scheme of things actually is quite narrow often. You owe it to yourself to try to broaden your interests. That means more reading, more work, maybe courses that are not quite mainstream in, in your domain. I mean, uh, that's, that, that's life. Maybe, uh, maybe a petroleum engineering uh, PhD student should be taking a course from the mechanical engineers on energy systems. That would be a darn good thing. Even a fourth year level course on energy systems in mechanical engineering where you have to hit the thermodynamics very hard. And then you can understand how, for example, an organic Rankine cycle uh, engine uh, can be hooked up to a hot water well, which you have designed. I think that as we go down this transition, energy transition pathway, uh, the prizes will be grabbed by the people who think laterally, not just in, in, their, narrow, in their narrow domain. So for example, uh, just last week, I was describing to a friend of mine about uh, about uh, you know uh, drilling, and he said, "Oh yeah, blah blah blah." And I said, "No, no, no, no. I'm not talking about rotary drilling. I'm talking about different drilling techniques. And percussive drilling is now there. We have achieved we have achieved the ability to percussively drill holes seven kilometers deep. And that's not rocket science. It's a lot harder than rocket science. I mean, rocket science is easy because the equations all work." But these are the kind of lateral thinkings that you have to uh, incorporate in, 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 your, uh, in your expertise that you develop. So don't, 
become too narrow an expert. You will have to change technical pathways. You'll have to put on different technical hats during your career, probably repeatedly, because the whole area is in very constant flux. Don't neglect that broad education. That, that would be a message that I really want to send to students. Thank you. And I'm going to reach out to you by email, um, actually, about um, another career related event that's very closely related to this that I'd, I'd just love to chat with you about. Um, sure. but, um, you know, sort of looking at looking at all of this. So um, I'll actually um, I'll put my email address in the chat. I think I have yours. So I'll reach out to you afterwards if that's yeah, okay. Reach out to me and we can arrange a Zoom meeting and have a virtual coffee together. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Sari, uh, stay well. I wish you good success in your studies and uh, we, uh, we may thank cross paths much. again. All yeah, thank you, thank, thank you very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nisnell. Yeah, thank okay. you. Very interesting. Bye-bye. Take care.